Um, can I now introduce Prof um, Professor Chris Hamm. Uh, Chris is Chief Executive of the King's Fund in London, and before that, for many years, was the Professor in Birmingham. And many of us of a certain generation spent a lot of time in Birmingham sitting at his feet. He also uh, took a brief detour into the Department of Health, where he ran the strategy unit. Um, on a personal note, and last year the theme running through was everybody that Peter had invited to speak had influenced me in some way. Um, Chris was actually part of my first pay negotiations in that when I was first offered a chief executive role, one of my um, uh, sort of things I negotiated was being able to be in a particular learning set with Chris Ham, because it was a learning set which not only did what learning sets do, talk, but actually it tried to do other things like publishing what it talked about to try and genuinely make a difference. And I was really privileged to be part of that learning set with Chris for many years, and I learned a tremendous amount from him. So he's gonna talk about medical leadership and why it may be ain't all that is cut out to be. Thank you, Chris. Well, thanks very much, uh, Jill. Thanks to Peter, too, and the faculty for asking me to come and speak uh, today. I've been an advocate of medical leadership for many years. Delighted, therefore, to be able to address this question today. Peter's asked me to share the results of some new research I've undertaken with colleagues. Uh, and what it does is to both raise a question and to sound a warning, a warning that we, we need to do uh, much better in the development of medical leadership, in the way we value medical leaders and support them and help them to do what we want them to do. In other words, improve patient care and uh, provide the best possible care within the available resources. And like Nikki, I think we need um, a lot more deviance in the NHS, positive deviance, people who are prepared to innovate and to show what is possible and no more so than in the medical profession. So I'm going to try and build on what's already been said this morning. I won't go into a lot of detail about the background to the research or the methodology, although I'll show you a slide or two on each of these. Uh, we've been working for three or four years on this research to try and provide an up-to-date picture of what is the current state of medical leadership in NHS trusts in England. I shared these results with colleagues in other countries at the World Federation of Medical Leadership in Vancouver earlier this year, and I have to say many of them were envious that we do have this research, we do have evidence and data on indeed what is the current state of medical leadership in England today. We did it in the context of those of us um, old to remember, certainly Peter, Jill and I fall into this category, Roy Griffiths' report in 1983, which in many ways can be said to have begun the journey that we're all on here today, the journey to encourage and support as many doctors as appropriate and possible to take on leadership roles. And there have been studies in the 1990s in particular to evaluate what impact had Griffiths' recommendations uh, made. There's been further exhortation from Bruce Keogh and particularly from Aradati saying we need to redouble, renew our efforts in this direction. So it's a journey that's been going on for about 30 years. We were funded by the uh, NIHR through the SDO program to carry out a study through a questionnaire survey and also by selecting nine NHS trusts to do more in-depth uh, case study analysis of what processes were in place for medical leaders to work with managers, to work with nurse leaders in developing and strengthening patient care. And then to try and relate the results to what difference did it make to organizational performance. This is uh, a copy of the front cover of the research report published in April this year. You can access it on the King's Fund website, also on the NIHR uh, website. And the question is a real one. Are we there yet? Have we reached the end of the journey that Roy Griffiths set us out on 30 years ago in making sure that doctors really are able to control budgets and services to lead the development of care and to do so alongside general managers? Because, of course, in his report, he talked about the importance of both of those. 
So our results in brief, I want to talk more about the implications and address the question, have we set up our medical leaders to fail? Have we indeed, I think Peter, your phrase was, uh, have we damned them with faint praise? Well, what we show, perhaps not surprisingly, is quite wide variations. There are exemplars of organizations that we found which are doing very well in developing medical leaders and showing the results around their performance. Equally, there are some that are doing far less well. Great differences, because actually this is one of the areas where successive governments have not been prescriptive, either about the particular structures, clinical directorates, divisions, service lines, or indeed the processes that should be put in place within those structures. And there are variations, too, within individual trusts. So in our case studies, we found examples of some directorates or divisions which seemed to be particularly well-led, where there were productive relationships between managers, medical leaders, and nurse leaders. And in the same organizations, you would find the opposite of that. So great variety, good practice, mediocre practice, and indeed poor practice. And much, of course, hinges on the particular capabilities and characteristics of those who take on medical leadership roles. We heard time and again that their personal credibility mattered a great deal in their ability to lead their colleagues, lead skilled and autonomous colleagues who often did not want to be led, who wanted the autonomy that goes with being a skilled medical professional. And as this journey has progressed, of course, trust leaders, chief execs and boards have invested a great deal in leadership development, supporting people to go on leadership programs of the kind that we run at the fund and many other organizations do as well. And greater formality also in appointing medical leaders, going through, if you like, more professional processes for uh, advertising, selecting, shortlisting, and then recruiting the right people into these critical roles. And partly as a consequence of that, we heard of this engagement gap between medical leaders, doctors occupying formal leadership positions on the one hand, and their colleagues, their followers on the other hand because there's a sense in which, at least in some organizations, medical leaders are more identified with, if you like, trust management, and therefore feel more detached from uh, the body of the Kirk. I think that would be an appropriate phrase to use here, north of the border. And that isn't necessarily a problem, but it is part of the journey that we've been on. We concluded, if, through our case studies, through our questionnaire survey, Yes, progress has been made since the previous research studies were carried out and published in the 1990s. Yet despite that, it seemed to us there was really no fundamental change in the relationship between the key players in divisions and directorates. And my reflection, I just want to dwell on this last point for a minute. Go back to Roy Griffiths in 1983, asked by Mrs. Thatcher, coming from a background in uh, industry, a senior leader within the Sainsbury supermarket chain to advise the Conservative government at the time what should be done to strengthen leadership and management within the NHS. And he made two crucial recommendations. The first was move away from a tradition of consensus management through multidisciplinary teams running our hospitals and healthcare organizations. Move instead to general management. Appoint chief executives who would be visible leaders of their organizations and of their teams. And then secondly, also recognize that you can't run a high-performing healthcare system unless you engage lots of people in leadership roles, particularly doctors. So this is where the journey around resource management that led to clinical directorates and the arrangements we have today started. And both of those were given equal weight within the 1983 Griffiths Report. And our reflection, having done this research, is much, much more progress has been made in developing general management than in developing resource management and medical leadership. And we need to ask ourselves the question, why is that? If both were seen as being very high priority by Roy Griffiths, why is it that so much time, effort, and resource has been 
put into the development of general managers and general management, and by comparison, medical leadership has received much less attention. So medical leaders do occupy these hybrid roles in this precarious middle ground between managers and, and medics. And there is this awful phrase of doctors going over to the dark side when they choose to pursue a leadership path. And I simply reiterate that phrase because we heard it so many times in our field work. And there are many obstacles which I'll come back to. And these are the hurdles we need to jump and overcome to make the step change, to listen to the warning signs, not to continue on this really slow journey of change and improvement, but to accelerate uh, in a way that now is urgent and essential. So why does this matter? The article on the left is a paper I wrote for The Lancet in 2003. Jill referred to my time um, on secondment in the Department of Health in the strategy unit where I worked with colleagues including uh, Alan Milburn as the health secretary at the time on the reform of the uh, NHS. So I stand here before you as a recovering civil servant. Uh, having had a fantastic time working in the department at that time, trying to shape plans and strategy for the future of the NHS in England, uh, but uh, not being too displeased either when that time came to an end and I could uh, uh, regain my independence and my ability to speak out in an open and honest way. And I wrote that and published it when I was still in the department because one of the insights, one of the many insights I gained was that sitting there supposedly in the cockpit of power and influence in Whitehall, it felt very different. Um, that the ministers were pulling the levers to try and change and stimulate and prod and poke and improve the NHS, but often the NHS didn't take much notice. And it didn't take much notice because, of course, if you use a nautical metaphor, the NHS is much more like an armada of small ships than it is like an aircraft carrier. And you can't dictate to an armada of small ships where you want them to go. Each ship needs its own captain, its own crew. There needs to be an admiral of a, admiral of a fleet leading those small ships broadly in the right direction. In other words, we need lots of leaders at all levels within the NHS. And particularly, we need leaders who come from clinical backgrounds going into work every day, into their clinics, into their surgeries, into their teams, committed to doing the job they were employed to do, but doing it even better and improving on that for the benefit of patient care. And my reflection in the Lancet piece was, therefore, a lot more needed to be done to support clinical leaders. And I, me I meant clinical leaders, not just medical leaders, because it seems to me we need to adopt that broader perspective if any government of whatever colour was to achieve its objective. So that's the logic as to why it matters. And there is good evidence. I, I deal in the currency of evidence, good research studies, which show that there is a relationship between medical leadership specifically and organisational performance. The work of people like Goddard, Peter Spurgeon, the study by the LSE jointly with McKinsey, showing a relationship between organisations where medical leaders are prominent and occupying key roles and how well those organisations perform. Of course, there are many other factors that also contribute, but that certainly is supported by the evidence. I was reminded of this earlier this year. Norman Lamb, the care and support minister, asked me to lead a small delegation to visit integrated systems on the west coast of the states. We went to Kaiser Permanente, went to Intermountain, we went to Virginia Mason Group Health and one or two others. Every organization we visited, we met first and foremost very talented, skillful medical leaders. And these were medical leaders, I realized, who were bilingual. They were fluent in clinical speak and they were fluent in management speak. And they were incredibly impressive because they were able to straddle those two worlds. Not only that, but there was a majority of medical leaders among those that were asked to meet the minister and the people who came with him. And I reflected, if it had been a minister from, let's say, New Zealand coming here, he would have met a very different cohort of leaders, no less talented in their own way, but far fewer coming from medical backgrounds when you visit our high-performing organizations. 
And the reason that Kaiser or Group Health or Virginia Mason perform so well is because they recognize that simple truth. You have to have some of your best medics involved in corporate leadership roles as well as leading their teams and services within the organization. So finally then, what does all of this mean? Well, it means we need to make a step change in how we value and support and how we develop our medical leaders. Robert Francis's report showed very clearly the counterfactual. If we do not do that, you end up with medical staff in struggling organizations who are actually disengaged from the leadership of those organizations. And then very tragic and bad things happen to patients and service users. Quality and safety suffer. That is a very stark warning from Robert Francis and Mid Staffordshire. It's a warning we need to take seriously. So back to the obstacles. We need to remove the barriers that get in the way. We need to ramp up the time commitment of our medical leaders. We need to ensure that a much higher proportion of doctors working in the NHS, wherever they work, are encouraged and supported to take on leadership roles. Medical leadership cannot remain a minority interest. It cannot remain a minority interest. It's something that all medics in different ways need to be involved in, including those in formal established leadership positions. And that needs to be supported through development. In patient safety, we often talk about the bundle of changes and the bundle of interventions that are needed. And I want to borrow that idea here. It's not just by offering more leadership courses sending 50 doctors off to Harvard for eight weeks to be developed and supported. That will achieve very little at great expense. And we can't afford to achieve very little at great expense. We need to recognize it's about developing the career structures. It's about culture, how we value people who go into leadership roles and stopping talking about the dark side. We need to support followership as well as leadership because we risk setting up our medical leaders to fail if we invest a lot in their development without also recognizing they cannot lead successfully unless their colleagues are willing to follow them and follow them with commitment. And we need to create an expectation. We need medical leaders at all levels working alongside experienced managers. That duality of medical leader and manager is critically important. And the NHS can indeed learn from the organizations I've mentioned in Europe, in Australasia, and further afield, because they've learned this lesson, and they know they cannot be high-performing organizations unless they commit to this bundle of interventions. As I was preparing my talk, I read a fantastic blog uh, from Dermot O'Riordan. I don't know if Dermot's here, and I don't know if you read his blog. A very honest, eloquent account of his recent experience being a medical director within the NHS and the challenge that he, challenges that he personally has encountered, being able to provide safe surgical care as a surgeon medical director, while also giving enough time to leadership within his organization and the other things, of course, that bu busy, talented doctors always get involved in. Yeah, and raising the question, the question that I'm raising here too, is now the time to make a step change, to move much more towards uh, an NHS where medical leaders are valued. They commit their full time where that's appropriate, more of their time where it's not. We support them, we put in place these career paths, we provide and develop a culture that really supports all of the things that I've been talking about. I've conducted this research with Helen Dickinson, Ian Snelling, and Peter Spurgeon. I know Peter is with us today. I want to really acknowledge this is a team effort, not my own work, and also a number of other colleagues supported us too. And of course, also to acknowledge the funding that came from NIHR and the SDO program in particular, without which I couldn't have stood here today and talked to you about the evidence that underpins my view that we are setting up our medical leaders to fail. I hope this is a wake-up call, it's a warning, and I don't think I need to persuade you too much, but we all need to persuade the powers that be. We now need to redouble and renew our efforts around medical leadership. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Chris. Very thought-provoking. Um, one of the uh, seminal moments of my life, I'd believed it for a long time, but when I was at the NHS Confederation, and obviously every story of catastrophe in every organization, we used to read because we were trying to talk on behalf of the NHS. And the thing that struck me in every one of those, there was one ubiquitous thing, whether it was about a rogue surgeon, whether it was about organizational failure, was somewhere in the story, there was a schism between the people trying to lead the medical leadership community and the medical community and the clinical community and the general management of those organizations. It was completely ubiquitous. And one of the challenges I've started to talk to Peter about, which I think is a challenge for the faculty going forward, yes, build a cohort of strong medical leadership, but as part of the debate, you need to be debating with and engaging the general management community, because together you can move the world and tackle these. Separate, you spend energy slagging each other off, and that's wasteful. So thank you, Chris, for, I think, setting a really interesting uh, set of things. And thank you also for reminding us of the international perspective. We are not alone on this journey. And in the room, amongst the 700 people who are here, there are people not just from the UK, but from uh, other countries. And we can share on this journey, because if we get it right, we can begin to tackle 21st century healthcare. If we get it wrong, it's only one group of people will suffer, and that's the patients. And the whole mantra of the faculty is that actually good medical leadership and management makes better patient care. Whether you're a clinician or whether you become a leader, there are ubiquitous skills that help you be better, whether you're in direct patient contact or whether you're actually trying to change the world from the Department of Health. So thank you very much. Um, coffee break now. Um, uh, be back, please, promptly at um, uh, 22. Um, and please get your um, little pads stamped, because I really do want somebody to demonstrate that you are genuinely competitive, and you must not let me down uh, by not demonstrating that. So thank you very much, and thank you for the morning.